family members, immediate family members who have, you know, gone through that challenge where, you know, they're dealing with their own challenges in terms of, you know, fiber, they're trying to take in, but, you know, they have to battle all those yeah a lot of stuff and I don't have that but you just never know when if it could potentially yeah. happen hopefully mm-hmm. it doesn't so you know I was like this is probably my ins- as I mentioned before this is probably my insurance policy yeah to just secure the reassurance this, the reassurance right yeah. to securing this for long term because you just never know what may happen welcome to the show I am your host, Anya Fombat, and I spark the heart conversations that challenge questionable cultural and societal norms that threaten the well-being of the African community. And I also share stories about growing up as Africans in Africa and in the diaspora. I strongly believe that normalizing open discussions and sharing experiences, whether good or bad, will not only make you find your voice, but will broaden your sense of purpose and empower others to do the same. So if you have ever tried challenging certain African cultural and societal doctrines, or if you have ever felt like it is about time that we confronted these issues in our African community and do better as a people, or even if you have always been interested in learning about the experiences of other Africans growing up in Africa and the diaspora, then you are in the right place. Welcome to Living African. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Living African. Today, I have here with me Mandy Anyangwe, and she is a Cameroonian. And our topic of conversation is going to be a very unusual one, which I am super excited about. And it's going to be about egg freezing or egg cryopreservation. Now, basically, egg freezing is self-explanatory, but it may end up being a bit more graphic than <laughs> we may think. So it's just extracting the eggs. You know, every woman has should have eggs. And of course, every man should have sperm, right? And the egg, the sperm meeting the egg produces an embryo which forms a baby. Now, some women choose to take out some of their eggs and freeze because the older a woman gets, the less viable her eggs are. So some women may choose to take out some of their eggs at a younger age and freeze them for when they are ready to have a baby down the road so that their eggs will still be viable for reproduction. So basically that's what we're going to talk about. And we're going to hear from the horse's mouth from Mandy, who has actually been through that process. And I'm super excited to have you here on Living African Podcast. Mandy, how are you doing today? I'm good. Thank you. Thanks for having me and good to see you again. I know. Thank you. The last time I saw you was like almost a decade ago. Yes. <laughs> I I know. In, in Cameroon, we're eating fish. And that I know. <laughs> I know. I know. That was, that was super fun. Yeah. I look forward to seeing you again, honestly, but I am super, you know, glad to have you on here for us to have this conversation, which I hope will be as interesting as much as informative. So let's just go straight to it. So can you please tell us a little bit about yourself and basically your story in regards to egg freezing? Sure. I'll be more than happy to. So I I go by Mandy Anyangwe. I live in New York City and I've been in the U.S. for well over 10 years now. And so my journey with the egg freezing process started in a couple of years ago. You know, I've had conversations with some friends and, you know, just maybe going through some you know, reading, I'm, I'm really very good at, you know, just doing some research about certain things. And, you know, I bumped on egg freezing and, you know, I used to think about maybe I'll get this done someday, but, you know, I never really put any plans towards it up until when I decided to and to go for it. And, you know, I went through the process and, you know, I'm going to get dive into the details, you know, shortly, but that's just how my, my journey of that thought process started. Right, right. And so why exactly did you decide to even have that interest about egg freezing? Sure. So 2020, right? You know, 2020, the the, the year of like, the pandemic, the everything year of the, changed, right? the lockdown, <laughs> everything changed, you know, everything changed. So, you know, the t- your mindset about looking at life, you know, in a lot of ways, you know, 2020 gave us a lot of time to do some self-reflection. Yeah. Um, 2020 gave us time to actually, you know, take interest into our personal 
grow into our friendships, communicate more because we had a lot of time to ourselves. Mm -hmm. And I remember having a conversation, one of my girlfriends, shout out Jane, she's based in Canada, Edmonton. And she was telling me her process of, you know, she was going through some challenges, you know, with this whole fibroid thing. And, you Mm -hmm. know, I have a lot of family members and friends who, Mm -hmm. you know, are going through the same process or going facing the same challenge. Mm -hmm. And, you know, she told me about potentially doing it. And, you know, that's where I started doing some, you know, research on it and looking at potentially doing it. And uh, yeah, I went through at that time, I was really working at my current company and uh, that's Amazon. And, um, you know, I went through the benefit process, read through the fine print of if, you know, potentially they can cover it. And I could, I saw that they did. So that's when I started taking much more interest and looking at potentially doing it. But at that time still, I didn't have a timeline, but I was like, this is something I'll probably do. Right. So yeah. I started reading through about why people freeze their eggs because, you know, people do it for various reasons. Some people want to focus on their career. Some people want to do it because of health reasons. Some people want to do it because it's like an insurance policy, you know. Yeah. And the, la- and the ladder was the reason why I did it. I decided to look at it like an insurance policy where, you know, you just never know what will happen in a year or two. You just never know what mm-hmm. happened down the road. And if I am fortunate enough for my job to cover 90% or maybe 95% yeah. of the cost, why don't I go for it, right? So that's that's, that's what triggered me to to really take so much interest in it. Yeah. I mean, that's such a bold move that you made. I I don't know any other person that has ever made that move, you know, because it's something that we always think that, oh yeah, these are things for people in the West, you know, people who are not interested. I mean, usually, you know, freezing eggs basically means that if you want to have a child through those eggs, it would definitely be in vitro. And in vitro, again, is another taboo topic in our community. Nobody wants to talk about in vitro. I mean, I had a friend, an older friend who had done in vitro many, many years back. And it's like she herself did not even want the child to know that she was conceived by in vitro because they call them the test tube kids. She doesn't want the child's. Yeah, she she didn't want the child's self-esteem to be low because she was a test tube kid or something like that. It was so ridiculous. And, you know, I mean, it just really goes to highlight the need for us having these conversations. We have to break that stereotype. We have to normalize these conversations. I won't want anybody calling my child a test tube child. I wouldn't want to be a te- to be called a test tube child. We breathe the same oxygen. We have yep. the same blood flowing in our veins. It doesn't matter how anybody was conceived. You know what I mean? So, yeah. and that has also been like a challenge for me, especially with you know, recruiting guests to come on the show to talk about IVF. I've actually spoken to a couple of women behind the scenes who want to, some of them start by having interest and then we end up saying, you know, hey, they end up saying, oh, I want to be anonymous because, you know, I don't want people to know with me. And I'm like, I mean, sometimes I take anonymous guests, for example, if it's like, I mean, I've had anonymous guests before, like if people are trying to protect the innocence of the children in terms of like domestic abuse or you know, divorce and marriages and same things that happen, you know, you don't want your spouse your child to look at their mother or father differently and stuff like that. I understand. But a topic like in vitro, the same reason why I'm trying to normalize this conversations is the number one source of a challenge to me, because I want us to openly talk about these conversations, but the people that want to come on want to be anonymous. So it defeats the purpose. You know what I mean? So I really appreciate you actually coming on here to talk about your story, because this would probably or possibly open up the door for more women to come up and say, but this is, I'm not alone in this. This is something that's normal, you know? And I don't know, did you really know about any other person that had done this before, especially in the African community? I had no idea. There was nobody I could use as a point of reference. You know, I talked to a few of my close friends, my support system, you know, and, you know, I was fortunate that, you know, I have a good support system mm-hmm. as in for girlfriends and even male friends where, mm-hmm. you know, they, they, they will be like, yeah, go for it. Of course, there's some people who looked at me like, this Mandy, like you're always thinking out of the box. You're always going, you're always figuring things out your own way. But, you know, I personally did not see it as a taboo, like something mm. weird. You get what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. you know, I saw it like another end, uh, means to an end at yeah. some point, right? And, you know, just to piggyback on what you said before about, you know, this stereotype and how we, especially Africans, yeah. we look at things, you know, you called out the IVF process, how people yeah. consider kids as test tube kids. Yeah. You know, it's just the same way I've heard people talk about 
if having birth, you go through the whole natural birth, as we call it, mm-hmm. and you're, you're seen as a brave woman, as brave a woman, yeah, who do C-section. Mm-hmm. You know, I've, I've actually been in a, in a community or in a part of a conversation where, you know, a lady on aunt asked, somebody put to burn, a lady was like, was it natural? Was it C-section? I'm like, why is it? Why does it matter? Why does it matter? Yeah. You get what I mean? Like, it's we really, really have to change that, yeah. that mindset. We really, really need to do better in mm-hmm. terms of this because... I'll tell you, a lot of these kids that we call test tube kids are probably way better, smarter than yeah. you know, natural kids. You get what I mean? So it's just, we just have to look at a kid as a kid. We have to look yeah. at people who go diff- take different routes, different yeah. paths to achieving something. So we shouldn't yeah. really, you know, put people in a box and say they're doing this because of this. I am, you know, going through this process, I am 100, I'm fortunate and lucky that I'm healthy. Like yeah. I'm 1000% healthy. I'm going to walk you guys through the process eventually. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I had the doctor never said, oh, there's this just a chance of this or, you know, we're concerned about this. Maybe you shouldn't do this. She actually encouraged me mm-hmm. to freeze as many eggs as I want, because even if you freeze 100 eggs or 20 eggs, it doesn't change the price. It's mm-hmm. you're freezing that egg, right? So, <laughs> Um, yeah, so it's, I just want people to embrace change and yeah. embrace life. You know, the yeah. world is changing. The world is innovative. There are going to be yeah. new processes, new opportunities coming out for different people. So yeah. let's just be open-minded to seeing things the way it is, as opposed to what we're accustomed to or what people made us think, you know, life right. should be. Yeah. That's a very empowering thing to say. Thank you so much for that. And you know, the funny thing is you will be surprised that, you know, even though we both don't know people in our community that have gone through this, there are actually people that must have gone through it, but they just don't want to talk about it. They're hiding it. And then they probably will talk about it with their immediate partner when they want to do it. Finally, when they want to do the IVF and stuff like I, I feel like there are many more cases of IVF in our community than we even know about. But a lot of women, especially, they don't want to look like they're, you know, they're weak or even the men, they don't want to look like, you know, they can not procreate the natural way. But then again, like natural is what the community or the society sets as a standard. You know what I mean? Like yeah. you said, it's a means to one end. It doesn't matter how you get there. It matters that you get there. Right. And that's the same thing that's applicable to life. It doesn't matter. You want to be a doctor. You want to be uh, whatever. It doesn't matter how you get there. People spend eight years. People spend 20 years. People spend four years. It doesn't matter how you get there as long as you get there. You know, so I hope that we sparking this conversation, us sparking this conversation will literally open up another kind of worms for us to really take a look at ourselves in, in, in the mirror and ask if we're really honest with ourselves and the people around us and try to use our stories to empower those around us. So going back to the egg freezing process, one of the things that I really like that you did, which a lot of us as Africans, especially, we don't really take the time to do is to actually make that informed decision, right? And to make that informed decision, it requires a lot of research. It requires us to do the work. You know, we don't like doing research because research has not really been a big thing in our community, even growing up. We just do things because somebody tells us to do it. Like, oh, if your neighbor has done something and it's good, they're like, oh, yeah, I did this thing. It was good. You should try it. But you're not really asking for your own self. Like, is this really the right thing for me to do? Are they doing it the right way? Just because it worked for them, will they work for me? And things like that. So I'm glad that you did the research. And a lot of people don't really know how much, you know, more insurance companies cover. You know, I mean, for the egg freezing and IVF specifically, most insurance companies don't cover it, but that doesn't mean that some insurance companies do not cover it. It doesn't mean that. And fortunately for you through Amazon, they covered it, which is a good thing, you know? Yeah. So if, and I would think that if they didn't cover it, that would have probably been a huge factor for you not going ahead to do it. So a lot of people don't end up doing things just because they are not informed sometimes, not even because they cannot do it. They're just not informed. So being informed is very, very important. Now, can you, you tell us like did you have any drawbacks before you started this process you know that was such a huge step to make like were there any moments where you were discouraged or were there any people or just you know ideologies in your head or things in your head that were talking you back like hey don't do it don't do it Okay. Just before I ask your question, I wanted to throw some, shed some more light into a point you made about making an informed decision and, you know, doing your research. Mm -hmm. A lot of us get hired into companies and we don't really read the fine print of, okay, what does this company offer? Mm -hmm. What are the benefits? A lot of times, you know, people just pick up 
pick whatever the recommended insurance policy is, but you'll be surprised to know or to see what your company offers as insurance policy. Yeah. You know, some companies offer you know, for, you know, some, some surgeries that you'd be shocked. You know, I don't want to go into that. I don't want to digress, but you'd be shocked mm-hmm. at, a, at what some companies cover. I mean, like a hundred percent, you know, um, nursing moms, like new moms, what they cover, especially if you're in consulting where you have to travel, they take care of your, your pumping, you know, breastfeeding, the FedEx overnight. Like there's a lot of, you know, there's a wealth of resources out mm-hmm. there that, you know, and I know people who, before they even get jobs or before they apply for a company, they read a lot of what they offer as part of benefits mm-hmm. before they make that decision, right? So, yeah. you know, I like to encourage everybody and employ everybody like, hey, before, you know, especially if you're a corporate America, try as much <laughs> as possible to do your due diligence when you're making those moves, you know, within mm-hmm. the companies. It really helps to factor mm-hmm. a lot of those things in. Mm-hmm. Now, to answer your question, in terms of drawback, I really did not, like when I made that decision, right, I'd set goals for 2021 mm-hmm. and it was one of the goals that I would do it, but I didn't put a timeline to it. So, but once it just kicked, it just clicked, like, you know, I came back from vacation and, you know, I was looking at, you know, this is October. I have this three months to go to the end of the year, you know, what's next? I was looking at my list, like, you know, my goals for 2021, what's, I was looking at, okay, I checked this. I did not check this. I'm like, but what is stopping me? I I did not even, I had not called one hospital or one clinic yet. Right. Mm -hmm. I already did the research and I knew my company was going to cover it, but uh, I didn't make any calls yet. So that's where, you know, I was like, let me go for it. Let me just, you know, look around my, you know, zip code and see what uh, fertility center my company covers for it. So in that, during that process, the only drawback I think I had was when I was reading through the process, I was like, I have to inject myself, but I didn't really come to terms with what that means. Right. And I'm going to dive deep into that once we get to yeah. people subsequently we'll get there but that was just me thinking about it like oh I have to inject myself but I also felt like maybe I'll just find a friend who's a doctor I have a friend with CRNA mm-hmm. like I'll probably just go to the house you know every day at a certain time but you know but that I feel like that's a major drawback I had but nothing really you know I didn't really have any thoughts at some point like hey this is probably not it I probably should not do this no not really mm-hmm. I was I I made that one, that first call, I was just good to go. It was like smooth sail from there. Wonderful. Wonderful. Now we make that decision like, okay, this is it. On this day, I want to start this process. Can you walk us through like the entire process and we can break it down in different parts since it could be very long and complicated, right? Mm-hmm. So let's start from, you know, your very first visit with the doctor. I believe it was with a, at a fertility clinic, right? So Walk us through your series of visits that you had and then how you started the process, the active process of taking the pills or injecting yourself, whichever one came first. Sure. And then, you know, till the end of the, the extraction of, okay. of the eggs. Of my initial process, the first process I, I had was with my OBGYN. I had a, my annual visit and I told the doctor that's when I made that decision, right? Like, this is it. I'm going to make that call. I told her, hey, I really want to do the egg freezing this year because we had talked about it in my prior uh, visit. And I was like, what's your thought on this? And, you know, she's like, yeah, I'd rather have your 30 year old egg than your 38 year old egg. If you want to have kids at 38, I have no problem with that. But I'd rather use your 30 year old eggs than your, mm-hmm. you know, than your 38 year old egg. Not that you can't have kids at 38, no. But yeah, she if was I like, if you, you, yes, if you freeze your eggs and you want to start having kids at 38, even if I know you, you have maybe 80 percent chance or 100 percent chance of you know taking it naturally, I'd rather mm-hmm. have that, right? She, so she made it seem so easy, like it's not a big deal, you know, right? Right. And so right there. I made that call. Like I went through the hospital fertility clinics that co- that my insurance covers, mm-hmm. and I called the first doctor, and the doctor was not available until the next, the following year. I was like, okay, which doctor is available? I went through, did my research, looked at the reviews because I wanted somebody who was who was relatable, you know, mm-hmm. someone who had empathy. Though to me, those things are important that I can relate with, right? I didn't care if it was a male or female. I really did not have a preference. So uh, this doctor, Dr. Bishop, was available to see me the following week after my OBGYN visit. And I was like, okay, book me with her, right? So our first visit was a virtual consultation on Zoom. We met, she 
just walked me through the process, gave me the timelines and she was like, do you have any questions? I asked the same question. So I might, do I really have to inject myself? Can I come to the clinic? Because the clinic is a walking distance from my apartment. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, can I just come into the office and do this? She's like, no, we empower everybody. We, we, we have somebody to walk you through. Even if it's on the video call, don't worry, you figure it out. A lot of people start like you, they, they have this fear. So she really calmed me down and right there, I will tell you the process is so structured. I mean, wow. from like, I had like four people attending to me. You have the doctor, the fertility specialist. You had the nursing assistant who gives you all the instructions of, okay, today you have to go to the lab and take your blood work. You have somebody, I can't even remember their, their, their titles, right? But you have another person who who give you tutorials on how to inject yourself. You have another person who is on standby, who is on call that you can call at any time of the day. If you have any issues or you're experiencing any challenge or something, or you don't have your medication on time, like the, and you had the pharmacy was also once you start the process the pharmacy texts you right they have somebody on on standby because they give you the medications as needed they don't just give you you know to the for the entire process they'll give you for the first three days the like okay once it's the third day they send the other ones like they mail it to your house right so mm -hmm. process is really structured so day one when i when i did the consultation the doctor sent me to the lab and of course, they have to start at, you know, at the end of maybe midterm or end of your cycle, your monthly cycle. Mm -hmm. So I went to the lab, they did the blood work and I had to wait for a week because coincidentally, when I had the doctor's visit, I was on my period. So I was hoping because I wanted it to go quick, to be honest. Mm -hmm. So I was hoping that once they did my blood work, she would start right at the end of my period. But yeah. she said, no, she'll have to wait for my next cycle. Yeah. So I had to wait for one month. So once we did the blood work, the blood work came through and it was good. And she said, OK, when my, my next period comes, like the day of my first period, I should give them a call. And as God has it, I don't know what happened, but my period came in two weeks earlier. I guess probably was a mental, mental. thing. Yeah. Yeah. So my period came in two weeks earlier and I called the doctor. I was like, this is what's happening. And she said, no, it's fine. No problem. That happens. We're going to wait for this cycle and we're going to wait for two more days and then just contact your pharmacy that you are starting on so, so and so day. That's day one. And I had to go in for an ultrasound. So when I went for an ultrasound, they noticed that that two days after they noticed that I was um, ovulating, like my, my period, like I, it was messed up. My period was oh messed my up. Goodness. And I, and to, be, to be honest, it was a mental thing because when my period came, that was supposed to be my ovulation period. Right. But because my period came earlier, so I was menstruating at the same time I was ovulating, which was weird. So I was like, is this normal? Do I have a problem? She's like, no, that's OK. This is could be psychological. It's fine. So we're just going to wait for your next period right which was supposed to be the all like following month mm -hmm. and but she said we will just keep monitoring you so i was going to the hospital every other day every i mean every other day i was going to the hospital because they did not necessarily have to wait for my period but they have to you know go through the side process they have to it's they have to time it you know we have yeah. that whole i'm not a science person but they have that whole mm -hmm. cycle where cycle. yeah exactly so i remember this day i went to the hospital and she said yep so you are contracting like your the eggs are uh, whatever what was releasing, whatever terms yeah. you use releasing so once the eggs finish releasing then we can start the the you can start taking the shot mm -hmm. so this is we're looking the timeline here is like maybe one and a half weeks into post the period that came early right mm -hmm. and so i remember this day i went to the hospital and i had a morning visit and i was running late and they were like okay that's fine you can come in two days at the following day I was like, no, I really want to come today because I wanted to start as soon as possible and get it out of the way. So at that time, you know, I was getting myself under pressure. A lot of things were running through my mouth. Like maybe I shouldn't be doing this. Do you get like, you know, those little fears within me? I'm like, maybe I, I probably it was not the right decision. However, I was like, you know what? I started this process. I'm going to finish it. Hmm. So the day I started taking the shot, when I say shot, two injections, right? So they had to walk me through the process. I went to the hospital. I had like a 30 minute session. They do every, they tell you how you, in, you know, mix your injection. Like I, I could never have imagined that. I don't, and please, this is not a scary process, right? It's just a psychological, psychological thing. Time. Yeah. I could not have imagined that I would actually one day inject myself. One of the reasons why I'm not in the healthcare field is because I can't even stand my own blood. Yeah. So, <laughs> so you know, but me injecting myself, I was like, wow, I'm really brave. Like I had that myself in the back. I'm like, girl, you're brave. Yeah. So they walked me through the process. 
process, how to mix the, the art videos, like on YouTube, what to do, what, uh, you know, the measurements and all of that. And from day one, I did three, I did two shots, day two, two shots, day three, two shots. And every day you go to the hospital because they have to do an ultrasound. They have to do your blood work to see how your ovaries are expanding because they're measuring it right on to get to a certain size before they do the extraction. So I know I've been talking for too long, but I I hope I didn't lose the track of the cycle, like, you know, the timelines and, you know, how the thing, how everything progressed. Mm -hmm. So from start, to finish, we're looking at 10 days exact. And on the 10, on the ninth day, once the doctor feels like, hey, your your ovaries are expanded well within what 22 because every day I go to the hospital you have a ner- the the doctor and the ultrasound technician they're talking about 22 milli- millimeters 20 mm. some some say 12 this egg is 12 22 millimeters I'm I'm just listening right uh, you know every day I go to see 24 what's the another one before 14 so mm. I just assume that it keeps increasing and they want it to you know so they can get as many eggs as possible because that was the doctor's goal mm-hmm. to extract as many eggs as possible. So one of on the nine, I when I went for my ultrasound after the visit, they did the blood work. I got an email to take the trigger shot. Mm-hmm. So the trigger shot is the last injection you take before they do the extraction. So you take your trigger shot on, for example, I did on the nine, and I did my extraction on the eleven, and that was the entire process from start to finish so you go to the when you start the injections you go to the hospital every other day yeah and once you're midway through you go to the hospital every day for your mm. ultrasound and blood work some days they'll be like we don't need a blood work today we need an ultrasound some days you don't need ultrasound you need a blood work depending on how you know your blood count is depending yeah. on how the ovary sizes are so those that, that was kind of like a timeline Right. Thank yeah. you for sharing that. Now in the extraction, the active extraction process, were you like awake or like, was it like surgical? Was it invasive? Well, it has it was, to be invasive because it's inside you. Yes, it was in, it was invasive, but it's, it's, it wasn't, it was a surgical procedure, but you know, it was whatever, whatever terms they use, but it was a surgical procedure. I had to be sedated. Yeah, you had to be under anesthesia. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. Under anesthesia. So the last day prior to your, I remember I took the trigger shot on the 11th, on the 9th, and my extraction was the 11th. The night of the 10th, you're not supposed to eat, drink, or do anything after Midnight. 8 p.m. Right. After, no, I think mine was 8 p.m. Because I was taking my, I was taking my shots at 8 p.m. That was my cutoff time. Mm-hmm. So I think it was at either 8 p.m. or 10 p.m. But it was around that time. So I was not supposed to do anything until my extraction at 7 a.m. the following morning. Mm-hmm. So you go in 7 a.m., you know, they do their typical stuff. You undress. The nurse anesthesiologist takes you in, puts you in, asks you all those questions. I remember they asked me, what's your favorite destination spot? Or where would you like to go? Whatever. I remember seeing the Maldives and that was the last yeah. thing I remember. <laughs> <laughs> and, that was, and that was the last thing I remember. And the, the next thing I remember was, hey, wake up, wake up, wake up, wake up. I was, right. out, of, I was out of a surgical room and I was already put in my recovery room. It right. was a room. It was a recovery area because they're doing multiple processes a day. So it, yeah. I was put in my recovery area. She's like, wake up, wake up. You know, are you in pain? Are you okay? I'm like, are we done? I didn't even know how long I was there for. Right, like, right. I, I, I couldn't remember anything. So, but it was, it was quite interesting, you know, then looking back at it and thinking how scared, because that was the first time I've never been under anesthesia before. I've never had any surgery in my life. So that was my first experience. I remember I've been telling the, the nurse anesthesiologist, like, this is my first experience. So just take it easy on me. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> That's funny. That's yeah. funny. Wow. That's interesting. Wow. 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 Thank you so much. So now do you pay egg rent? <laughs> it's funny that I called it like that, but there's no other I, way. I I don't, I, I won't pay up until 2023. So the first year is free. The insurance uh-huh. covers it. And then from 2023 and beyond, you just pay an annual rent. Okay. And yeah. what is the shelf life? Like how long can your eggs last in the freezer? Uh, I think the doctor said for like at least 55 years. If I'm oh not mistaken. my goodness. Yeah, she, told me, she told me I can use it till I'm 56. Like she, she just basically told me you can use it whenever. Like there's no, like technology has improved in such a way that, you know, 
you can use even at 60 if I want to have a baby I can keep this ex till I'm 60 and I decide to just have yeah. a retirement baby if I want yeah. to you know so and it's gonna be as good as having a kid as I was 30 years old you know so yeah. I don't want people feeling like oh the longer the ex stays you know th- there's some weird you know, there's some conspiracy and stereotype about, hey, people have kids through this means they have the kids to come out mentally unstable or whatever. Mm-hmm. No, not really. That's that. Yeah. I read a l- I read a lot of articles about that, to be honest with you. And a lot of people debunk that. Even doctors, you talk to any doctor, they'll tell you. It's just like you people have kids at 25 and the kids unfortunately come out challenged. Right. So yeah. it could just be a genetic genetic thing. Genetic. It's not because yeah. genetic. It's not because mm-hmm. you, fr- you froze your eggs. No, it's yeah. not because of that. Yeah. No. That's very true. That's very true. It's very important for us to emphasize that because a lot of people just come up with these assumptions and ideologies that I don't even know. They're not fact checked and they don't have any evidence or yeah, evidence to base those assumptions off of. So it's very important for us to emphasize that. And, you know, like just talking about shelf life, as you were just saying, you know, it can last like 55 years or something. It just got me thinking because there's this documentary, but it's not a docu-series. It's just like a two hour idea think documentary okay. or I don't even know but I I, I don't know because I just did not get myself to watch it I don't know if you've watched it it's on Netflix mm-hmm. like this Asian family their daughter she I don't know how old she was maybe like two I would say and she was having this terminal cancer and there was nothing they could do about it this is not even in the past tense. I think the child is still frozen. They decided to freeze her and I think the father is a scientist and he wants to he has dedicated his life to to figuring out a solution, a medical solution wow. to help that their daughter, like to, to treat that cancer. And so when they come up with that, this is just a preview. You know, I don't want to uh-huh. make assumptions because I really could not get myself to watch it. But they have frozen her in this like big container, like a cryo container or whatever. And when they discover the, the treatment, they're going to defrost her and treat her that's basically what it is about i would think what? allegedly this is alleged it's not <laughs> like i don't want to get sued for anything you know <laughs> but yeah that's that's where that story was going so th- there are a lot of questions like you know would this kid stay a baby two years old forever because you know of course when you freeze the cells you you extend their their shelf life you know and you know, it's a form of preservation. So this mm-hmm. child has been preserved. She's currently preserved and she wow. was two years. And I think this happened years ago. And I think she's still preserved. They, like they just cannot let go of her. They cannot see her die. So mm-hmm. I don't even know where her soul is. You know, things like that. As a Christian, you make me thinking, think like, yeah. hey, where is her soul? Like, where is is it, where's her spirit? You know, yeah. like, is it yeah. still in the body or where has it gone? You know, so yeah, it's, it's, it's a freaky concept i would yes. say and I, I don't i can't get as a mother i can't get myself to watch it i swear yeah. not even I as wonder, a mother I, I saw it before i became a mother and i still cannot get myself to watch it i, I wonder what it, that timelines are like you see does he give himself like okay within two years or five years if i can yeah get a solution i give up like yeah you know, just yeah, I, I'm, I'm definitely going to let you know privately, like the name. I saved it in my list. I still have not gotten myself to watch it, but I just saved it because I don't want to forget about it. But these are conversations mm-hmm. that, you know, remind me of things like that, you know, like how long the longevity or the shelf life of, you know, a frozen egg is pretty yeah. long, you know. So in the process, you know, what challenges did you experience ah. physically, mentally, emotionally, hormonally? Everything. What, yes. What challenges? <laughs> uh, everything uh, hormonally I don't think I did ha- experience any challenge but physically mentally psychologically I definitely experienced some challenges I remember day one you know my sister shout out to Akam you know she was right there with me on the video call whatsapp call and she was I sent her the link to the video of the tutorial and I was trying to inject myself mm-hmm. and I was sh- I was literally shaking like you know, because they give me some little tips, hey, numb the area with some eyes, press it and then put the in. But imagine you injecting yourself. I, maybe some people. And one thing is I'm not scared of needles. You know, growing up, I'd rather take injections over medication, over tablets. But, you know, but at this point, I'm injecting myself and, you know, psychologically, you know, after the first one, I'm like, wow, I'm a champ. I did that. But day two, I was by myself. And I asked myself, why am I even going through all of this? Is it even worth it? You, you know yeah. what I mean? Like, you know, 
do I even need to do this? You know, like just thoughts just cross your mind. And, and I'm like, well, maybe if I had a friend who lives around here who is a doctor, I'll probably just go there. But, you know, it's not as easy. Yeah. Right. Because well, I was supposed to do it later in the day. People have their schedules. People have their yeah. work. People have their families. You don't want to inconvenience people. And, you know, psychologically, I remember maybe probably day was day four, day five. I can't remember specifically what day was. And I messed up the solution. I dropped the liquid. You have the powder and the liquid to mix it. Right. Mm-hmm. So I dropped it on the floor because I was panicking. And I remember I told you at the beginning, the pharmacy gives you exactly what you need. You know, mm-hmm. when it comes to solution, they'll give you more. But when it comes to because those medications are very expensive, to be honest. Yeah, yeah. So they give you only what you need. And, you know, if you have to have an extension, you have to call them and say, hey, you know, I'm not ready here. So I need more of, you know, going to fall or whatever of those medications, tetratide and whatever. And I had to call the hospital uh, and the doctor on call. And I was like, hey, I'm going through this process and I messed up one of the solution and I have just one left. You know, what do I do? And mm-hmm. he was like, no, do it right away. It was a she actually, she said, no, that's okay. That's fine. That happens. Just use the other medication you have and make sure you call the pharmacy right after this for them to send you more. Because mm-hmm. the pharmacy also takes into consideration you're doing this by yourself. These are some of the challenges you face. Yeah. And this can potentially happen. So to send you some more and they mail it directly to your house. I don't go pick it up or anything. Mm-hmm. The same day delivery. I don't know if it's because I live in the city. That's why. Or if you live in the suburban area, it's the same process. But, you know, you order in the morning by 6 p.m. The medication is with you. So, you know, at that moment, you know, when I finally did the, took the shot, you know, I was just like thinking, why am I doing all it, A lot of times the only challenge was more like, I would say, psychological, mental. Like, why am I doing this? Is it even worth it? You know, why am I putting myself through all this unnecessary pain? You know, but I, I have this mindset of as a go-getter, when you start something, you have to finish it. Yeah. So I had no plan B in terms of I'm stopping it or doing something else. This is it. I have to finish it. I had a really good support. Like I had some friends who call me. I say, hey, next time you're doing it, let me know. I want to watch you do it. And I had some people say, no, don't call me. I don't want to see it. I don't want to see you injecting yourself. So right. you know, I had this whole, it was kind of comedic where <laughs> some people were laughing and like, yeah, who sent you? Why do you go put yourself in that kind of situation? <laughs> but they're not saying in the bad way. They're just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, I, yeah. So, so we laugh about it and They're just making you know, light of the situation next- yeah. exactly <laughs> exactly so so yeah and you know those kind of the challenges i face but overall you know it was pretty straightforward um and i'll say maybe at the beginning when i was going to start the process when the doctor say hey you're starting today at 8 p.m or they, they, they say pick between any time after 5 p.m., between 5 and 9 p.m., take your shot. I think between 5 and 10 p.m., but just make sure you do it the same day every day. Mm-hmm. Um, I was still comfortable and self-confident that I was going to be able to, to do this, the, um, the injection. So mm-hmm. I called the hospital. I'm like, please, the virtual tutorial is not cut it for me. I need somebody to do an in-person tutorial. And I had a doctor's visit that day to do my blood work and ultrasound. And every, the doctor, the, the hospital was busy. There was no nurse available to attend to me. So I left and I told the receptionist, I said, said, hey, I'm not happy, you know, with, I'm not confident. I'm not happy with the way you guys are doing this. Like not every virtual um, tutorial doesn't cut it for everybody. You have to find a way to have an in-person tutorial for people like us who are not comfortable, who've never done this before. Mm-hmm. So I think the, 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 the customer service lady, the front desk lady saw how, you know, how disappointed I was and, you know, and how uncomfortable I was. And within one hour, I got a call. Fortunately, I was still around the area. I was having breakfast next to the hospital. Mm-hmm. And one of the nurse called me and said, hey, I see, I heard, you know, you have some concerns, challenge. Are you around the area? Do you want to come back so I can walk you through in person? And so she had everything. She had all the sample injections and she's like, you do this. She's the one who actually gave me the tip of make sure they don't really encourage it. But for people who are really scared, get mm-hmm. some ice. She gave me some ice pad, put it in the freezer. Yeah, to numb the area. The, to numb the area. She said you can even use ice, put it on a clean cloth, numb yeah. the area so you don't feel the injection going in. So that's a little trick for anybody who sees this video. I want yeah. to go through the process. <laughs> the doctor doesn't tell you, just right. put ice on it. You don't even feel the injection going in, not at all. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. so yeah, so that was, yeah. that was kind of mental and psychological challenge I faced. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. You know, I, I'm really glad that you had that support from almost every angle. And, you know, it's kind of 
unfortunate because a lot of other women, especially African women, may not even have that support just because for various reasons, not only because they don't have people to support them or they don't have people that believe in in procedures like that. But it's just also because they don't even want to let anybody know about it. Right. So it's like, if you don't let people know about it, how are you going to get the support? Right. You, you had your siblings, you had your friends, you had, you know, probably extended family and, and stuff like that. But a lot of people may not have it. And I really feel based on your experience, I feel like having that support system is extremely important, you know, for you to not necessarily regret your decision, but just to be comfortable and know that you have people backing you up and and people rooting for you, you know? So I feel like that's one of the things that are very important to have. Now, what do you like about freezing your eggs about that decision? Um, The first thing is it took out some level of burden for me in terms of that. Okay. First of all, I'm not married, right? At this Mm -hmm. age of my life, you have that external pressure from family and friends. Mm -hmm. Hey, you know, you're successful, you're this, you know, you should be thinking of settling down or you should have settled down by now. You should have had kids. You know, everybody yeah. has this, they set those timelines for you on your behalf, yeah. you know? Yeah. Oh, yes. And, <laughs> you know, so personal, deep within me, the only thing I had as pressure when it comes to, you know, as a woman, when it comes to settling down or having kids or getting married is the whole thing we call biological clock. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I have seen people, friends, family members, immediate family members who have, you know, gone through that challenge where, you know, they're dealing with their own challenges in terms of, you know, fiber, they're trying to take in, but, you know, they have to battle all those all those stuff and I don't have that but you just never know when, if it could potentially happen, hopefully Mm -hmm. it doesn't. So, you know, I was like, this is probably my, as I mentioned before, this is probably my insurance policy to just secure the reassurance, the reassurance, right? Yeah. To securing this for long term because you just never know what may happen. I'm mm-hmm. always of the fact that you just never know what's gonna happen tomorrow. You just yeah. never know what's Stay gonna. Prepared. Yeah, exactly. So I always felt like this would take some of that pressure off of my shoulders, where I can actually take my time and do me and do what I want to do, and I know that this is not gonna be a problem because a lot of us females. When we get to a certain age, that pressure comes in and it's normal. It's natural. Hey, some people get married because they, they feel like I want to start having kids. It may not be the right situation for them. Yeah. So I never wanted to put myself in that position that where I have to settle or pressure myself to be with somebody I don't want to be because I feel like my biological clock that to be, I'll be very transparent. Yeah. And that is one of the reasons why, you know, I was like, okay, I'm 30. I'm not in an exclusive relationship. I don't see myself getting married within one or two years. Mm-hmm. So why don't I do this? Right. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. And it took off that pressure and it gave me some a little time to make up my mind or decide how I want this to be or how I want my planning my life for the short and long term. Yeah. Um, so I would see that as a reassurance policy where I don't have that pressure. It doesn't mean that I don't want to get because some people see that and say, OK, she just probably doesn't want to get married at some point. She probably mm-hmm. just want to have kids. No, that's not why I did this. But it's a reassurance and insurance policy for in case I want I get to a point and marriage comes at a certain age where I'm having challenges, you know, having kids like my doctor says even if you get to a point where you find love you want to get married and you are ready to go naturally I'll rather have your 30 year old ex or 31 right, ex right. blatantly you know and yeah so I'll rather go with an expert somebody who's been in the industry for 25 years mm-hmm. who's done this over and over than just go with people's ideologies and yes. things that are not fact checked right so yes. so that's that's that i'll say the, the key reason i did that and in in addition to the fact that i've seen people i know people are currently going through that challenge and they were wishing that they did freeze their eggs mm-hmm. wishing mm-hmm. that you know i wish i did this i wish i even knew about it right do, do you know right. what i mean right. you know i was having a conversation with an aunt when i started you know going through the process i told her about it she was like i wish i did it you know what i mean like I wish I knew about it. I wish I didn't prioritize that, but I was focused on education. I was focused on other things, which is fine. You know, it doesn't, it's not for every life. It's different. It's a different path for everybody. But that was the key factor that motivated me to do it. And I'm happy I did it. And I feel, yeah, I feel like that burden has been taken off my shoulder a little bit, lifted up, you know, and I can just take my time and do what I have to do and figure life out. So, mm-hmm. yeah, mm-hmm. that's awesome. You know, and like you said, there are a lot of women actually out there who have probably thought about it or probably don't even know about it, but will 
would have wished someone told them about it or at least would have made that proactive decision to do it, you know, and they didn't get to do it and they missed their timeline. But hopefully this conversation actually sparks something in a lot of women to really look mm-hmm. at their lives, especially women who are like hitting their meat and late thirties. Like, okay, if you don't, you, you never know, you could get married in one month, two months, you could get married in 10 years, you know, you never know what happens, but for your own reassurance or your own assurance, like if that's something that you know, you want to consider doing. Hope this conversation that I'm having with you, you know, will maybe encourage them, you know, to try to do it, you know, and I'm really grateful that we had a chance to talk about this. And for those women who actually are hesitant to do it, or at least who just learned about it, what word of encouragement will you have for them, you know, in terms of the process and just encouraging them to go ahead and and give it a try if that's what interests them? Um, I would say to them, you know, just be open minded. It's it's not it doesn't if you can afford it, because I know, you know, we talked yeah. about affordability, the insurance and all. Right. If you can afford it, please go for it. It doesn't it's not going to do any. It's not there's no there's no implication like you're not going to have it's not like a surgery where you have a scar. Like it's just yeah. see, like a regular monthly period. It just is it's done and gone. Right. Yeah. And you have something sitting somewhere. You don't need to go babysit it and check right? So mm-hmm. you don't have that pressure of, is it good? Is it not good? Right. And you know, the doctor will tell you at the end of the day, how many eggs they extracted and how many mm-hmm. were mature and how many are preserved. You have all that information and you don't, don't see it as you, it's, it's not like, I really want people to be open-minded, just see life as this opportunity out there. Yeah. See, see it as an, as how can I even put it? Like, I just want folks to take off that mindset of, you know, it's a taboo. It's, it's not common. You know, my aunt will say this, people will say this, people yeah. look at me like I'm crazy, you know, just don't worry about it. Like the more we start doing things for ourselves and not doing things for, for our others. future and not for others, life will be much more simpler. It will be much more easy. Right. And I, I think also that's what propelled me to even make that decision because I look at life a little bit different than a lot of my peers, mm-hmm. you know, which is fine. You know, everybody's different, but I don't really overthink it. Just do it. If you can afford it, just mm-hmm. do it. And I know people were saving for it. I know people were saving. They have a goal. They're saving for it to get it done. And it varies. Right. Prices vary. So it depends on your state. It depends, you know, like some insurance companies will cover half of it yeah. or maybe all. So just do your research search you know if, if it means living and joining amazon i'm seeing this now living right no, free I'm promo for amazon on record. No, I'm, I'm, yeah i'm okay it's okay to say this i'm not breaking any rules even if right. it means living and trying to get a job at amazon i'm if, and if amazon is doing it they're probably microsoft is doing it apple all those companies are doing it because it's comp- Competitive, right? A lot of these companies right. are doing this to compete amongst each other to bring talent. So if yeah. you have the talent and you think that this is something I want to do, then apply for a job and apply get here and get your eggs frozen. Yeah. Right. You know, so just be open minded and just, you know, go for what you want. Forget about what people say or what people think yeah. and just just do you. Yeah. By the way, hey Amazon, if you're hearing this, you better sponsor <laughs> this episode. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Mandy. So how You're can welcome. people reach you? I'm sure a lot of women or even men will probably want to reach out to you um, to ask questions and also know where you did the procedure because maybe they will, you know, want to go visit the same people. So can you please tell us how the audience can reach you and also where exactly you you froze your eggs, like where you did the procedure, what fertility clinic, in, if you're OK with that? Sure. So you can reach me on on my social media handle, Mandy April, on both Facebook, Snapchat and Instagram, Mandy, M-A-N-D-I, April, A-P-R-I-L. And I did my process with Columbia University Fertility Center. They are very reputable. And, you know, if you check them out, the, the, I believe in reviews, right? So do your research. And there are multiple doctors there who do the same thing. So, but the doctor I did with was Dr. Bishop Lauren. Mm-hmm. And so if you're interested, just hit me up. I'll be more than happy to share more details that I couldn't yeah. dive deeper into this. I'll be more than happy to have that conversation anybody who's thinking about this. And if you also are trying to Maybe get into Amazon. We are hiring the talent. Right? Hey. Just go, ahead hit, <laughs> go ahead and hit me up. I'll be more than happy to be a referral for you. So right. please just be open-minded. 
in. I know, Florida. I know. You know, the purpose of this podcast was, you know, just to spark those hard conversations and make sure that people are looking at life from an open-minded perspective, right? And yeah, so, yeah. you know, episodes like this just solidify the reason why I started to begin with, because these are very unusual, or at least these are very rare topics that are never really openly talked about. Like you literally just spilled your business out to us, you know, and you didn't have to, but you wanted to because you wanted to start that trend of us opening up to one another without being insecure, without, you know, feeling like anybody's going to use it against us. You know, that right there is power through vulnerability. And I totally, totally agree with everything that you said. I really admire your point of view and the way your outlook on life in general, you know, I just want to take this opportunity to thank you so much for, you know, taking part in this platform. And you have no idea how much you have impacted a lot of women out there already all over the world. I mean, we have listeners from all over the world, even from the weirdest places that you wouldn't even think about. So thank you for starting this conversation. And I hope that it becomes a movement, especially amongst women in our African community, you know, and you're welcome at any time to share any topic, you know, that you are passionate about. And I would really, really, really love to stay in touch and see how things work for you. And I don't know if you have any last words before we round up. Um, yep. I know for sure some people are probably wondering, you know, how much it costs because I said, you know, my company uh, covered most of it via my insurance, but it's if varies from state to state, clinic to clinic, right? So mm-hmm. just to look at a ballpark of $10,000 to $18,000, yeah. including the, the blood work you do every day, the egg freezing cycle, like you have the stimulation cycle, which is, mm-hmm. you know, take all those injections mm-hmm. and the egg retrieval surgery. And the freezing costs, you know, some places it varies from like five hundred dollars to twelve hundred mm-hmm. every year so it's an annual thing and if you're in a company where you have hsc you you can use your hsc to cover for that so you don't have to pay out of pocket you know or well pre-tax right you can you know save up some money for that and then pay use that to pay that's that's what i'm gonna do next year mm-hmm. um pay and pay it up for this um storage cost so and if you feel like hey my storage cost is expensive over year i think legally you you can move you can change facilities, move it from one storage. Oh, no. I can decide to, yeah, from one to another. So you can, you can do that if you feel like it's cheaper somewhere, but you know, manager's going to be there. And I know some, you know, reading through some documentations, some people say it's good. This is a time where if you've never had a wheel, you want to write a wheel because a wheel, your, yeah. eggs are, your eggs are important. There are women who cannot produce eggs or who wish they had one and you can decide to donate it, right? You can decide to donate to a family member who is struggling. It's okay, you know? Oh. So just like I said, be open-minded and have those things at the back of your mind those are decisions you have to make some people if it's okay we don't want to donate it it's fine it's your it's your decision mm-hmm. right so so this i just wanted to throw that out there for people probably wondering you know we didn't talk about numbers and yeah so that it's, a, it's just a it's a ballpark mm-hmm. and of course like i said my company covered most of it but i will be yeah. honest i probably had to pay about just like a thousand out of maybe fifteen thousand or eighteen oh, thousand. Wow. So that's yeah. So uh, yeah, because you really have to pay ex- exactly, you have oh, to pay up through your your premium, your deductible, and your out of pocket expense, and then they cover everything. So so yeah, that's my story. So in case you like, I said, if you have any questions, please reach out to me, and I'll be more than happy to help and answer your questions. Don't put any timelines to your life. Don't feel right. pressured. Right. Don't, don't feel pressured if, if you want to have kids now fine if you feel like you're not ready and i feel like women should be very open to have this conversation if you're not ready yes. you're not ready you're not it's ready okay yeah okay you just oh yes yeah you have that at the back of your mind like okay when i'm ready i'm gonna have kids and it's all within you you're not yeah. doing it for anybody you're doing it for yourself for yourself yes oh my goodness thank you what a way to end the conversation <laughs> i really appreciate you coming on here once more mandy and i wish you all the best and i will thank catch you. you in the next episode bye bye thank you
That's it for today. Thank you for listening to our show. If you want to participate in the show or find out more helpful resources, then visit www.livingafricanpodcast.com for more information or email us at hello at livingafricanpodcast.com. Also, don't forget to connect with us on all social media platforms at Living African Podcast. You can also connect with Anyo directly on Facebook or Instagram at Anyo Fombard. Thanks again for listening and let's not forget to be more understanding and nicer to one another.